you and your team have quickly established your employee advocacy and social selling program. What do you think has contributed towards that in terms of, you know, your ability to kind of move quickly and, and show these early successes? You know, I think, number one, we have a terrific culture at Broadridge and a lot of camaraderie, even though we're global. And I would say in spite of being global, right? So if, you know, somebody in the New York office is finding something working, it doesn't take long before the London office says, oh, hey, me too, what are you doing that's working? Um, so I think one of it, one of one thing is it's unique maybe to our culture. But I think the bottom line is the everyone social tool really just makes it easy for us to curate content and easy for whether it's a sales exec or a business exec or a marketing executive to, you know, once a day or once a week, go on and click pre-approved content and share it out with a note that's personal from them. Um, so it's about making it easy, too. So uh, you've been involved with some some big companies before joining Broadridge. Um, Ernst & Young and UBS come to come to mind. Um, how have you seen marketing change kind of within the broader financial services industry, you know, over your career? And, and um, you know, again, I imagine this probably goes back to the uh, uh, to the client experience point. But, you know, where do you think it's headed over the next three to five years? Yeah, I mean, it, I, it's funny. I ma- majored in marketing in you know in university, so I'm one of those rare people who has really been a career marketer and salesperson as well. Um, so I've had a chance to see the industry change over the last really 20 years. And I'll tell you, starting out in financial services, I felt sort of um, I, it was you know I felt like a partner to our sales execs, and that we were. Um, an indirect face of the company. And then when I joined professional services, marketing really felt like a back office function um, and that we really weren't, you know, a front office function. At Broadridge, I think part of this is culture. I really feel like the marketing team and function is seen as a front office function as much as our sales execs are as well. So number one, culturally, it's got to be embraced. Um, but also the mandate of marketing has broadened over time. So now we partner very closely with the chief technology officer because it's embedded in everything that we do. Um, in some cases, there's a digital experience leader. In some cases, there's a client experience leader. Um, I've, I've personally been asked to take on uh, reviewing our client satisfaction survey initiative. Uh, so that touches a little bit on, on, on end clients and how satisfied they are with the company, not just pushing out content. Um, so, you know, I think, again, every company is in its own evolution. Um, but surely at Broadridge, marketing is seen as a front office function, which is such a fun place to be. What are some of the downsides when it's not? Because I think most companies probably don't operate that way. Yeah, well, so I've been in places where marketing and sales as functions report into different places in the organization. Mm. And that's a that's a challenging setup to begin with, because if your marketing and sales teams aren't aligned on the initiatives, you're working against each other. Right. So we're spending resources and dollars in different directions. Um, But at Broadridge, we you know, it's they are two. We recognize their two functions, but they report into the same place, um, which is terrific. So I think as a starting point, that that makes a lot of sense. And um, and when you don't, you know, in some cases you just end up spending um, maybe more money than you should on marketing efforts because it may or may not be aligned with your sales and revenue goals or what your investors are looking at or what your clients need. Um, so it really needs to be a coordinated effort. One of the things you said a few minutes ago was that the Broadridge sales team members are, you know, on an average basis, likely older than the sales teams at many of the companies that you work with. Um, I think there's this perception that social media in particular is something being driven by young people almost exclusively and that, you know, the older you get, you want to just revert to email or phone or whatever else. Um, You guys kind of break that stereotype, I think a little bit, what, what do you think is driving participation amongst, um, some of your sales staff that, uh, you know, maybe a little bit older? I, you know, I, it's remarkable, honestly. Um, and we joke about it, but I think at the end of the day, it comes down to how hungry you are as a sales exec, uh, for reaching, you know, new clients, new channels, uh, and how willing you are to, to take on, you know, learn about, new technology or innovative things. 
Um, again, we're, we pride ourselves and we trademark the, you know, the term, the ABCDs of innovation and not just for our clients. It's not just a buzzword, but we ourselves tend to be innovative. And, um, you know, I think going back to, um, you know, entrepreneurial roots, it's all about, you know, learning quickly and failing fast. And so, you know, if, if something isn't working, we're, we're, we're going to give it up pretty quickly. Um, but we're also quick to adopt and adapt. Yeah, you guys are very interesting in that for the size of your organization, you do seem to operate in a very agile fashion, which is which is really exciting. It's exciting to see that an organization of your size can actually do that. Um, any predictions for the future in terms of again marketing or or social? I guess you know again I see you guys as kind of being on on the leading edge of a few of these different categories in particular, you, your, your use of social in a sales function. But I mean, where do you think this goes from here? Again, back to our earlier conversation about clients wanting hyper targeted, personalized, customized and authentic content. Um, to the extent we continue to, to provide that, that's going to be important and a win really for anybody in whatever industry they're in. Um, and making sure that you're talking about things that your that your firm, your company is is able to offer to clients, and and really sticking to your knitting, and and focusing on at the end of the day, client needs. That's really the most important thing. One of the things you said earlier was uh, AI is a category that Broadridge um, has solutions in. How do you think, or maybe this is something you're even working with your your clients on AI? You know in terms of its ability to deliver perhaps more targeted messages, you know, down to an individual level versus human communication, you know, someone from your company, a sales exec, a sales rep actually communicating out directly to prospects. Do you see them one kind of taking over the other? Is, is it, is it always going to be an important combination? I guess, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, specific to the solutions that we're offering that may touch AI, our AI solutions are not replacing human beings but they are providing uh, tools that enable the human being to have greater insight to their clients. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't other companies developing AI solutions that may replace a human being, but that's not the business that we're in. Um, you know, and I think that at the end of the day, we're going to need a combination of human intervention uh, to really thoughtfully you know, understand what the technology is telling us in order to give the best advice to our clients. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we see, um, I think oftentimes, and, you know, we're probably just really early days when it comes to, you know, any level of intelligent automation, you know, especially in the marketing world. But, um, you know, in years past, there's been uh, a lot of desire from those who we work with, you know, to make things simpler, make them more automated. And from a data perspective, you know, what we've seen being able to look back now at, you know, almost six years of working with our clients on their programs is that uh, the degree to which a message is personalized and, you know, I think even beyond being targeted, I mean, certainly it needs to be appropriate if you're sending it on a one-on-one -on -one basis, given who the audience is, but especially as it relates to sharing something kind of out to a, a more mass audience, a network, um, personalizing the message really yields significantly improved results and not just, you know, kind of marginal gains of five, 10%, but, uh, in some cases, you know, multiples better. So I think that'll kind of, that's something at least we're keeping our eye on from a, from a marketing and a sales perspective is, you know, of course, how do we continue to make things easier? Everyone's super busy. They have a thousand things to do all the time and that's probably only increasing, but, um, you know, how do we make the opportunities to personalize that message to better connect with a group of people or an individual contact um, just that much easier? Because, um, again, so few people are doing it and, uh, you know, it just has totally outsized results attached to it. Uh, absolutely. I, I, and we're seeing that, too. Again, the survey I mentioned uh, earlier bears that out in spades. Um, but it is a fine line between... Um, delivering up such personalized custom content and and then the sort of spooky feeling of knowing too much about someone yes. right and their buying behavior <laughs> so um yeah. but yeah we're definitely seeing an uptick in uh you know in in sales when you are you know really personalizing the content 
Hey, this is Jason behind the scenes running the mixer board. Just want to say thanks for listening and catch a new Everyone Social Bytecast every week from everyonesocial.com slash blog.